اسمحوا لي ان اقدم سعاده السيد مايكل فولي كمتحدث رئيسي للمؤتمرين وعمل السيد مايكل في التعليم الرقمي في البنك الدولي لاكثر من 20 عام وحاليا هو مستشار حول شبكات البحث والتعليم لتطوير واستخدامها لتطوير الابداع تفضل Thank you, Salam, and good morning, Your Excellencies, uh, Ambassadors, Ministers, uh, and Chairman. Um, and good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen from uh, Aroka and from Astrid. It's uh, a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, it's a real honor for me to be here, I have to say. Um, and I'm rather humbled, in fact, um, by being here because I, I'm not an engineer, I can't offer advice on networks. Um, I'm not a government official or a funding agency. I can't offer you money. Um, but I, what I can do is, is offer you some uh, of my own experiences in using uh, national research and education networks. And especially in the context of the theme of this conference, which is education, science, and innovation. Three very important concepts. So. Um, I'm a user of, of uh, telecommunications, and just very briefly, I'll tell you uh, how I came to be a user. I worked in the National University of Ireland and University College Dublin uh, for many years, and I was uh, offering a service in the uh, integration of technology in teaching and learning. And the driver for that was, in fact, to improve the quality of teaching. Uh, many universities, they reward research, they don't reward teaching. And so we had a university teaching committee, which um, my input was on the technology side, and I saw a great power of that. Um, so, uh, sorry, I thought it was my fault. <laughs> um, but in fact, uh, they, my first, uh, and coincidentally, and a happy coincidence here, my first experience of distance learning was in fact uh, in 1986, uh, about 32 years ago, with a project between our university in Dublin and the University of Jordan in Amman, in this region. So I'm very happy to be back in this region. It was a project sponsored by Intelsat, the satellite uh, owners, and we did a, a live series of lectures on water resource management to students and academics in uh, Amman, in Jordan. And that was very, very successful. We had live interaction coming back by telephone. We had no NRANs at that stage. We had no. Uh, Skype and, 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 and video conferencing in that way. But to me, it really uh, drove the, the, the notion that technology and communications can improve the quality and the access to knowledge on a global scale. And that's what drived my, uh, drove my work for, for, for many, many years. I worked on European Commission projects for 10 years accessing funding from Europe, uh, partnering with other European countries and developing systems. And then I ended up in the World Bank Institute where we set up what we called the Global Development Learning Network. And that really was a global partnership uh, using blended learning, using video conferencing, the internet, etc. Um, to share knowledge among countries. And it was a, a horizontal, it was south-south sharing. It wasn't just World Bank economists telling people how to run a country. And that gave me a, a, a huge vision of the potential as well. And early on I found that in um, emerging NRENs in some countries were happening. And in fact our first partnership was with the NREN of Pakistan, uh, PERN, Pakistan Educational Research Network. They had a very extensive network of 80 universities with video conferencing in it. And then we worked with India, uh, and with CERNET in China, uh, with Reuna in Chile. And so, to me, the key to um, uh, working with uh, technology and communications was to go through educational institutions and use national research and education networks. So I began to lobby my colleagues in the funding side of the World Bank, says we need to fund these networks. And so their response, of course, like any uh, administration is, can you write a report on this? And this is what I'm here 
I've been asked to, to, do, to, to uh, talk about is the report on the role and status of national research and education networks in Africa. It's the whole of Africa, uh, it's including North Africa. Now, um, this is uh, downloadable um, from the, a very good website. If you want to know about NRANS and want to know how they can really benefit a country, uh, I suggest you go to this Jayon site, it's caseforenrans.jayon.org. The report is there in French and in English, and it's a very short report. It's a very thin report. Uh, and in fact, only less than half of it is about the status of the networks in Africa. The rest is about the role of networks, uh, what they do, what their benefit is, why you should have them, um, and even how to establish them, and, and how and what the challenges are. So it's a useful one, maybe you could download it onto your tablets before you fly back to your home, and at the end of the trip you'll know all about NRANS. Um, so we could ask, what are NRANS? And, um, they're not really known. Uh, and many people in this room know what a research and education network is, but most academics in universities never heard of NRANS. Uh, they just use them. And of course, because they're invisible and they work, then that's fine. But the problem is no one understands their, con their, their, their concerns. Um, and so it's very difficult with, to make a case to government of why an NREN should exist even. Uh, what's wrong with the internet? What's wrong with commercial providers? Why have an NREN in itself? So um, we need to look back at where we're going in science and education and where the world is going generally. And it's a digital world. Um, it's a transformational uh, experience we're going through here, people don't realize really how significant it is. You can call it a paradigm shift, a revolution, a challenge. But to me, some people see things as a challenge, other people see them as opportunities. And to me, this is an opportunity. Uh, we can ask the important questions, what's the benefit, what's the impact, and what about quality? But if I could, if I could have just one joke in, in this presentation. Uh, um, there's a story in, in Ireland and where I come from, down in the rural area, a tourist was wandering around, driving around, and he got lost and he was looking for the nearest town and he came across a farmer and he stopped the farmer and says, I'm looking for the nearest town here and the farmer kind of looked one way and then he looked another way he scratched his head and he says, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here now that might seem like a very trivial thing but I think there's a lot of wisdom there I think a lot of the time we're starting in the wrong place we're asking the wrong questions um, it's important to ask these questions. What's the economic impact? What's the social development impact? But really, the type of question we should be asking is, because the digital revolution is here, it's a fact, it's not going away, so we should really be asking ourselves, how can we use it with quality and with equal access? The bigger questions of the economic impact, and a lot of funders are asking, what's the economic impact of an NREN? That's a very particular question to an NREN. We really need to look at the bigger picture of the economic impact of the internet and technology generally. And in fact, there is another report that reports on that, and that's another World Bank report. It's the World Development Report in 2016 called Digital Dividends. Um, and they, they Basically, I can summarize it by saying, yes, it does conclude that the uh, internet and technology does have an economic and social benefit to countries. And one particular sentence caught my eye. The internet promotes inclusion, efficiency, and innovation. And two words that really caught my eye there, was, one of them was um, uh, inclusion. It's meant to dance on the screen, sorry. Um, uh, and the other one is innovation. Inclusion is really important. It actually reminds me of another story. I was in Afghanistan uh, talking to the Minister of Education and I was talking about NRANs and why Afghanistan should have an NRAN. He was listening intently. At the end of it, his reaction was, Michael, this would be great for peace. He didn't talk about education, he didn't talk about science, he talked about peace. Because he saw the vision 
that if he can have his students in the universities linking into the rest of the world, looking at the broader world, that it can be a tremendous force for peace. So this is inclusion. Too long now, um, universities in developing countries have been excluded from research and from, from the global academic community. So let's look at science and education and see where it's going in this day and age. So we can ask, what do scientists do? A lot of people don't know what scientists do uh, or how they do it how they work. Most people have a, a kind of a, a traditional view of the, the, the scientist as a, a guy in a white coat, um, generally a guy uh, in a white coat with test tubes. Um, and in fact a, 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 a higher education commission person once said to me, the role of a scientist is to cogitate and to then come up with a hypothesis and go into his laboratory, he did say his laboratory, um, and to prove that hypothesis to make a theory. And my answer to that was, yes, to a certain extent, but most likely his laboratory is not in the same country anymore. Now science is extremely uh, uh, complex. And in fact, science now is more about uh, computation um, and our cliches don't work anymore. It's not so much guys in white shirts, it's people collaborating. It's about measurement, modeling, calculations, billions per second, sharing resources, and pooling expertise. And expertise is where the collaboration comes from. We live in a very complex world now, uh, and scientific discovery is extremely complex. Due to hyper-specialization, the breadth of human knowledge is so wide now that even experts in, in a particular field, they know a, a tiny little bit about that field. They need to share with their, with their colleagues. So, this hyper-specialization is going on so much, and I have a question, for a, a quiz, a trivial quiz for you. Can you tell me, what's the record for the number of citations in a single research paper? I'm referring to a paper that is the text of which is 13 pages, but the actual article is 33 pages. 20 of those pages are the citations for the authors. The answer is 5,154 in a, research, a recent research paper on the uh, Large Hadron Collider on the Higgs boson. This demonstrates that science is extraordinarily uh, um, uh, complex and we need a lot of collaboration. It's all about collaborative activity between specialists in hundreds of institutions around the globe, connected by high-speed communications links, sharing huge volumes of data generated by today's shared advanced instrumentation. And in fact, you have, another, uh, you have a new example of a shared instrumentation now in Jordan, in the Sesame uh, Synchrotron Accelerator, which is opening up the region to a lot of collaboration around. And of course, ASRAM will have a big function here because they need to connect uh, as scientists, they won't be just in, in, in Jordan, they will be from all over the world linking in to, to download data from this, from this accelerator. So really the lesson here is if you are not connected, you are not, you will be excluded. I repeat, you will be excluded from research now. So it, it's inclusion with the big eye uh, now that to, to have eminence because you will be left out otherwise. So that's research and science. What about education? As they say, the E in, in, in NREM. Um, and it's not always a big divide between E and, and R. Some people say, well, you know, our students really need the education bit. Uh, the research, that's for rich countries, etc. But let's look at the world um, and the trends in education in, in a digital age. Um, and there are many studies on this, and I put together about nine of them. Uh, and I'll go through them pretty quickly. Uh, the mobile and the smartphone are making technology universal. I was walking across the bridge, across the Nile, and there were three young lads taking selfies of each other with a smartphone. Um, everyone has uh, some, uh, a phone in their pocket now, and they're getting smarter. Um, so, a, a recent, uh, there's a concept called bring your own device, and rather than building computer laboratories where people students go into and, and, and t use the computers, everyone has their own device or will have their own device. 
four years ago in Kenya they ran a study and, and found that in fact 50% of students in Kenya, in, in universities in Kenya, have a laptop. That astounded me at the time, and this is going to grow more and more. So this bring your own device, having your own device always with you, uh, changes everything. It make, makes the distance learning is not just for those outside the campus; it's those for inside as well. Blending learning, blended learning is for all, and educa educators have to change in terms of they become more managers and mentors rather than what they call the sage on the stage uh, lecturing. In this flipped classroom, it was uh, uh, Mr. Khan of the Khan Academy who coined this phrase of the flipped classroom. In other words, you will get your lectures through open educational resources on the web and, that's, and you'll download those. There are so many things. Um, there are courses, uh, you can have Coursera on your, on your smartphone, you can have the Khan Academy, etc. So the lecturing is going on outside the classroom and this will lead then to um, redesigning learning spaces. We don't need so much the big uh, lecture theatres anymore because the lecture is on the web and the, it's more the tutorial, the project, the project meeting rooms, the group dynamics that uh, students working together will need in, in, in the universities. And wherever you go, your data is with you, wherever you go. Um, and so it's in the cloud, and so you can access it anywhere. And as we progress, as a student progresses to a university, this is where the divide between E and the R breaks down a little bit. More and more, in, in the final years in science and that, students are not so much uh, learning in the traditional sense of, of getting lectures, they're actually actively researching and developing projects. So they're, they're beginning to be the researchers as well. So that there's, education is research now. Um, and lastly, connectivity is presumed, absolutely presumed in Europe, North America, uh, in Asia, people presume they have connectivity. Um, so these are the uh, issues in, sci in education and science. And so internet and connectivity, I think we agree, are vital for science and for education. And the, both of these, to go back to the theme of this, both of these are the engine of innovation. And from a World Bank per perspective, innovation is the driver of development. So right from social and economic development to innovation and the underlying uh, forces uh, is education and science. Um, so, but how do we do this? How do we, how do we create this, uh, or how do we organize uh, internet for, for, for our universities? Do we make it a free-for-all? Do we let universities go off and, and uh, do deals with internet service providers? Or do we do the, what I would call the sensible thing? Have a national agency manage it. Um, an agency that comes from the IT community, um, that is trusted by, by, by the IT community of the universities, that is trusted by them, and that is not profit motivated. And we could put a name to that. We could call it a national research and education network. So I may be jumping the gun though, very quickly, but look at, let's look around the world and see what other people are doing. And so I made this map as part of the report. It's based on a Turina map, and I just updated it. Uh, this is in 2015, it may be even more up to date. Um, the, green, the countries in green are the countries that have their own operating national research and education network. A lot of countries have, are doing this. Not all of those countries can be wrong. Uh, the yellow countries are the ones that are in progressing in developing their world. The grey ones that, that are greyed out are the ones that really are in the very early stages or not at all. Um, so very few of those exist and maybe there are less of those at the moment. Apologies to Libya in case you're planning an end run. I made that in 2015. I wasn't getting data on, uh, sorry, not Lebanon, uh, Libya. Um, it, it's, it's still a grey one there, but maybe we can talk. There are some people, I think, from Libya here. Um, and of course then they're organizing themselves into regional uh, organizations uh, all around the world. Uh, and so this makes the, the collaboration even, even stronger uh, as, as well. So uh, we could ask ourselves, what is an NREM? Um, 
And just let me explain, just because some people maybe don't know what an NREN is. It's two things, I suppose you could say. It's both a high performance network and it's also the organization or the agency that actually runs that network. So you'll have a name and the name will be for the network and the name will be for the, for the organization. And they're set up in various ways. I won't go into the details of it, some of them are written there, but typically they're not for profit. Uh, and typically they get a lot of funding from, from, from government, typically, not 100%. Um, so what do they do? Um, well, again, a lot of, I remember in my time in the World Bank, he says, well, we don't do infrastructure anymore, we only do things like services. Well, NRENs don't really do infrastructure either. They lease capacity uh, on infrastructure. And it's the service that they offer is really what makes them uh, uh, worthwhile. Um, now, there's a whole list of services that I can, and it's in the report, you can read it in the report. But I want to move on to the, what really makes NRENs unique, and that is the advanced and unique services that they offer, including things like middleware. I won't go into technical detail, but these, just take my word for it, that these, uh, these uh, services are what makes uh, an NREN stand out from an, uh, an internet service provider, a commercial internet service provider. Um, and in fact, these are actually developed by the global community of NRENs. So in a sense, it, you could call it a kind of a currency uh, to allow you in the club, of the academic club. And so if you have an NREN, you can talk to another NREN and you have the procedures to do that. And your students on that NREN can do that. So it facilitates participation and collaboration in research, access to digital libraries, to journals, to databases, uh, sharing of instru uh, instrumentation like supercomputers. You, not every country needs a supercomputer. Um, but it, I did, what I'm trying to say is that it ends exclusion and academic isolation, which is really important. And again, you can refer to the case for NREN's website. It gives you lots of stories on, on how to do that. And just to give you one example of, of the global reach of, of these NRENs, these lines coming out from Europe, that is the Géant map, they, they have wonderful maps, um, but there's an APAN and TAIN map and in Asia, there's a Internet 2 have their map and uh, Latin America, Red Clara have their map as well. We'd lo I'd love, actually I love maps, I wish we would have a global map. Um, could I propose that we get together and do a global map of NRENs? Uh, it would be really impressive especially to impress governments as well. Um, I wasn't going to talk about this, but the, the, there's, um, the financing models uh, we won't go into, but in fact, typically, it's a mix between member fees and government funding. And these are European ones here, and you can see that half of them are fully government funded, and the other half are uh, fully member funded. But in fact, they're member funded by public universities that are funded by government, so they're really all public, <laughs> publicly funded in, this, in the end, anyway. And on governance, uh, what I would say is there are many, many different models of ownership and governance, but the one thing that is really important if you're setting up an NREN is that the academic community must feel it has ownership of it. It's not something top-down, run by government bureaucracy. It, there must have the ownership from, from the, uh, uh, the, the universities. Let me just briefly go through uh, the second part of that report, which is actually is summarized in one page. And as this is the page. Um, this is, uh, as of June 2015, uh, the development in NRENs uh, in Africa in three different regions, in East and Southern Africa, in West and Central Africa, that's the green uh, countries, and in North Africa, the yellow countries on top. Um, a lot of this is driven actually by the uh, European and country-funded project Africa Connect, which is an amazing project that is actually driving the program of NREN development in, in actually in this region as well with EUMED Connect uh, and, and, and the Africa Connect projects. Um, the, the different tones of color reflect, in fact, the different levels of development of an NREN as, as a summary. And they were based on, on what um, a, a Duncan Greaves of Tennet in South Africa, uh, NREN, uh, suggested as a way of measuring the cap capability maturity of NRENs. It's based on, on, on the IT industry. Uh, but he put in six levels, um, and you'll see that the first uh, four levels, um, there's no actual NREN, 
but in level four then uh, a formal NREN is, uh, has, is, is established and then there's inter-country links between that NREN and then number six, the NREN begins to offer REN specific advanced services. Uh, so in, in this map you see that Algeria and Egypt are number six, uh, they're on level six here. Um, I, and uh, by the way, I'm not dealing with the other ASRAN countries on this, this was specifically in, in North Africa and that. Uh, Kenya and South Africa in, in the East and Central are also at level six. The lines there, uh, the blue lines are the NREN's own links to uh, points of presence in Europe and the black lines are the, in 2015, are the Ubuntunet uh, connections there. If we go on uh, to uh, October 2017, just recently. This is the update, and uh, thank you to the JR people for providing me with some information on this. You'll see that Ghana and Nigeria now are linked in to the world. Once you link in uh, to either to Europe or to Internet 2 in the US, you're linked into the world, uh, because through that you go to everywhere else. But I've noticed too that in, in uh, East and Southern Africa, they're linking cross-border to each other as well, rather than always going to Europe and back again. This may be a lesson uh, maybe for the uh, Arab region as well. They need to be crossing borders uh, rather than going long distance around uh, to, to come back again. So that's the current status um, in, in, in Africa, North and, and, and Southern Africa. Um, the challenges, and the cha there are many, many challenges. Um, and one of them is the cost. Um, and this is due to certain vested interests, lack of competition, uh, lack of affordable either terrestrial or submarine cable um, and um, really insufficient government commitment I suppose um, and so either there's inadequate regulation or too little or too much um, and then on the, on the, in the country itself there's no real user base sometimes in many countries to come together. You need a critical mass of people who are interested in this to drive it. And then on the campus itself and the, and the, and the university readiness, the faculty maybe are not ready, they're not digitally literate uh, and also maybe there's lacking in a campus network. So these are the challenges that are, that are, are, are playing out. And these challenges, if I may go back to the digital dividends, are not digital challenges. They're not they're not technological challenges. They're what the, uh, the digital dividends report uh, describes very nicely as to get the most out of the digital revolution, countries also need to work on the analog components by strengthening regulations that ensure competition among businesses, by adapting workers' skills to the demands of the new economy, by ensuring that institutions are accountable. This is really important. We need an enabling environment to make it happen. And the enabling environment is analog. In other words, it's human. Um, I have a certain mantra um, about law. And people, government officials can quote the law or can quote the policy. But they quote it like it's a law of nature, like the law of gravity, immutable. In my, my view, laws are made up by people and people can change them. They can change policy, they can change the rules and regulations. It's a matter of will. So we need to ask the right questions, again, back to starting from. Um, not is the proposed NREN for it's a sustainable, which a lot of uh, governments do. Is this sustainable? That's an easy question to ask. What we need to ask is, how can we make it sustainable? And so you, in each country you will have all your own solutions about how you make it sustainable. You start with the principle, we will have one of these. And then you work backwards. Because very often, by ask, keep asking the question, is this sustainable, nothing happens. Because no one can give a real decent answer. You start the other way around. It says, we're going to have one, how do we make it sustainable? These are the kind of questions, the make it possible kind of questions. So what can government do? Well, enlightened regulatory policy is really the driver here. Uh, to make uh, access to, to co connectivity affordable. Uh, but also, uh, incre by increasing competition and deregulating is good, but you need to protect the public good aspect of an NREN. It's a public good. Um, so you need to support the establishment and funding of NREN and legislate it to operate. You have no problem in funding roads, in funding schools, in funding hospitals. Uh,
but you sometimes feel that an NREN has to be commercially viable on its own, when in fact it's such a vital link in the whole education and health and climate change and disaster management uh, stream of, of, of things. So if you don't have the funds, seek donor funding. And just to the NRENs present here, I've worked uh, almost 20 years in the World Bank and I've been approached by people, how can I get uh, funding from the World Bank? And I said, well, you can't, but your government can. Uh, the World Bank works with governments. Uh, it's a membership of governments. Uh, so you need to talk to your own government if you want help from the World Bank. Uh, you can talk to the local World Bank officials, bring them to your meetings, inform them, because they need education as well, as I found myself. Um, a lot of the World Bank people, again, know nothing about NREN, so uh, you need to educate those. But you cannot go directly to the World Bank looking for funding, you need to go through your, uh, your, 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 your government. Uh, small things, duty-free importation of equipment. Um, provide oper uh, uh, operators licenses with what they call AUPs, uh, acceptable use policies. The commercial uh, internet providers are worried about the competition from NRENs. NRENs need to be specifically for the public good of education, health, uh, libraries, museums, etc. That kind of knowledge side of the thing, not compete co competing with the commercial sector, otherwise the whole system breaks down. Um, and then you need to promote ICTs in education. Um, the students are using it. The professors, maybe not so much. Uh, so you need to kind of develop that um, uh, capacity. Developing partners, the funders, uh, if there are any here. Um, direct financing, uh, the financing was, uh, is an obvious one as well. Um, so maybe a trust fund. Um, but be realistic about the impact that an run can have. It's not a cure for cancer. Uh, and it's not going to end world poverty. But I'll tell you, without an NREN, you'll be a long way short of curing cancer or even ending poverty. Um, so higher, higher education institutions, again, they compete with each other. Uh, they need to collaborate um, to, on this particular one. They need to set up a, a, a campus network and they need to develop the digital literacy of their staff and the support the champions of innovation. NRENs, I very quickly go through it. These are the things that you need to do. Uh, you need to invest uh, in, in, in quality services, build the capacity of your staff, be open to collaborate with commercial uh, um, uh, operators, and remember the future is mobile. You need to be able to integrate that and expand the use of dark fiber. And also look at cloud services and see whether you can broker for them or provide them yourselves. So that's. Um, with that, I will lead, leave you with the map of the world. The rest of the world can't be wrong. Um, and basically, as our next World Bank person, um, thinking about development, development needs in innovation. And innovation needs education and science. And education and science needs connectivity. So thank you very much indeed. قبل معالي والسعادة اسمحوا أن أقدم اسمحوا لي أن أقدم زميلي الأستاذ يوسف الطلمان للشكر والتقدير في نهاية الجلسة الافتتاحية للمؤتمر شكرا دكتور سالم دائما دكتور سالم بترك لي أصعب جانب أصعب شيء أنا ما ما بعرف رح أكون أكيد رح أكون عاجز عن تقديم الشكر نبدأ نشكر الموجودين نشكركم جميعا نشكر كل اللي في الطوابق الأخرى اللي حقيقة يعني عملوا بجد وما تمكننا يعني مش هدفهم انه يسهلونا كل الامور وهم موجودين في الطوابق وفي الاجنحه الاخرى لجامعات الدول العربيه هاي اهم اهم جزء لازم نشكره طبعا بعد شكر الاتحاد الاوروبي نشكر الفريق اللازم بامانه الفريق مجموعه طلال ابو غزاله اللي في مصر شكر خاص صدقا يعني كان سهلونا كل الامور فكمان فالتقدير اللي بنعمله حاليا هو ل يعني اسمحوا لي نقدم بعض الدروع مبنيه على بعض الانجازات اللي بنقدمها كل سنه، كل سنه بنقدم دروع لمجموعه من الاخوه او او المؤسسات حسب الانجاز او حسب الشراكات، فاذا بتفضلوا معالي الدكتور بدر الدين العلاني ومعالي الدكتور طلال ابو غزال انه نبدا نستاذنكم ان نسلم بعض الدروع لل لعدد بسيط.
طبعا احنا بانتظار مصور يعني كمان انا حاب اشكر اللي هو الاتحاد الاوروبي بيصدر مجله اسمها كونكت كونكت هي موجوده في حقائبكم انا ارجو ان الكل يعني يعني يطلع عليها فيها تفاصيل لدور شبكات البحث والتعليم والتجارب وال والابحاث العلميه التي تستغل مثل هذه الشبكات اضافه الى انها تحتوي على قصص نجاح من منطقتنا ونحن ندعو انه دائما تكون ان نجاح مذكور في المجلات العالميه يعني هي من افضل المجلات العالميه في مجال شبكات البحث والتعليم واستخداماتها فنتمنى انه الكل يشارك ويطلع ينظر الى يعني ياخذ نظره عليها ومستعدين احنا بالتعاون مع بالذات لازم نحكي عن هلجا هلجا هي من الناس اللي مستعده تاخذ اي قصه وتنشرها في هذه المجله فشكرا لفريق جاينت اللي اصدر هذه المجله ايضا وصل وصل اسمحوا لنا ان نبدا بتقديم الدرع لشبكه الجامعات المصريه الاتحاد الدولي للاتصالات السيد كريم عبد الغني يمكن ما وصل فبنبدا مجتمع الانترنت اي كان هل موجود طيب ننتقل ل وي هاف كيفن فور فروم انترنت سوسايتي كيفن از كيفن اراوند كيفن وين يس بليز Our keynote speaker, thank you for coming and following keynote. So we have uh, just uh, talk for you, Michael. طبعا في في شبكه بحث اردنيه عربيه افضل غابت عنها فتره طويله وحاليا عادت الينا واخذت من اكبر الساعات على مستوى المنطقه العربيه تقريبا 1 جيجا بت بير سكند تم ربط شبكه الجامعات الاردنيه فاسمحوا لنا نرحب كمان في شبكه الجامعات الاردنيه. هذا هذا عن منظمه المنظمه العربيه لشبكات المحتوى والتعليم، والان عن المنظمه العربيه للجوده في التعليم العالي نبدا في الدكتور خالد وحيدي يستلم عنه الدكتور ماجد السلمي. اسمحوا لي كمان الدكتور محمد الحيله من جامعه الشرق الاوسط. ايضا الدكتور هشام صالح من المدارس العمريه في الاردن تفضل دكتور هشام
أيضا الدكتور منذر زميلي من المدارس الرضوان اسمه أيضا الدكتور هاني حامد وعن المؤسستين مؤسستين واضافه لطلال ابو غزاله عن منظمتين ومنظمه طلال ومجموعه طلال ابو غزاله اسمحوا نقدم الدرع لجامعه الدول العربيه فنرجو تقبلوا منا. بهذا الشكل نشكركم على المعاليك نشكر معالي الدكتور بدر الدين العداني ونشكركم جميعا على المشاركه في هذا الافتتاح الرائع والعدد الممتاز